Greetings. What I've got for you today is a bit of a beast as far as LED lighting goes. This is a Luceco 200 watt low bay LED fitting, meant as a replacement for 400 watt discharge lights. And it's bright. 21,000 lumens, that's brighter than two 500 watt halogen floodlights. And of course, you're going to want to see this. Here's a 100 watt light bulb. Let's see how it looks when the camera adjusts to the brightness of the LED fitting. Like I said, seriously bright, even with a dead section, which I'll come back to later. Power consumption is pretty much bang on the money at around the 200 watt mark. And the power factor is pretty good as well as 0.98. The light panel is made up of eight strips, each with seven parallel connected strips of 11 series connected LEDs, for a total of 616 LEDs. If we unscrew and slide this cover off, we can see that unlike the Laseco tube I looked at a few weeks ago, this uses a pair of off-the-shelf Tridonic LED drivers. The one on the left drives the middle four LED strips, the one on the right drives the outer four, with each pair of LED strips connected in series and the two pairs connected in parallel. Like this. I've measured the voltage across the output and it's 66 volts, which across 22 LEDs divides them down to 3 volts. If the output current is the claimed 1.4 amps, then that totals 92.4 watts for four full strips. And as it's driving 14 parallel strips of 11, that's 100 milliamps per LED. At 3 volts, so 0.3 watts each. So that's the overall design. Let's take a look at one of the driver modules with the lid off. As often seems to be the case with single-sided power supply boards, things are quite simple on the top side. Flip them over though, and it's a different matter. And here's how those top components match up with the bottom of the board. It might be a bit complex to trace out, especially as none of the components on the bottom have any component numbering, and in the case of the capacitors, no value numbering. And it's probably pointless. But hey, pointless videos are what I do best, so here it is. Let's take a look, skipping some of the details because I don't understand much of what's going on, and pick out some puzzles along the way. First up, we have some input filtering, and a full bridge rectifier, feeding a circuit based on an L6562 transition mode PFC controller, which bumps the rectified input voltage up to about the 400 volt mark if the data sheet is anything to go by. Moving on, we'll skip a section and come back to it. Instead, we find a power supply circuit based on an LNK562DN, which generates a low voltage power supply for use elsewhere on the board. Whatever it puts out is at least 11 volts based on the other components it's driving. And one of the things it provides power to, via the circuit we just skipped, is back at the start again, the L6562. Puzzle number one. The LNK562DN is powered by the output from the L6562 circuit, but the L6562 is powered by a switch version of the output from the LNK562DN circuit. Presumably enough power can get through L10 to wake that little power supply up and get things moving? Back to that bit we skipped. This circuit appears to control a switched low voltage supply for the other ICs on the board. As the outputs of either half of the LM2904 op amp rise, They'll start turning on Q3, which starts turning off Q4 and throttling the switched output. Half of the op amp appears to be regulating this supply using a Zener diode, as it doesn't seem to connect to much else. The other half is monitoring the rectified main supply via three 1 meg resistors and a 300k pull down for a maximum input of about 35 volts. Clamped by a Zener diode and smoothed by a small capacitor. If the mains drops too low, I guess it's going to try and shut things down. What's also sticking its oar in here is optocoupler U2 linking from the low voltage side. If this turns on, it's going to turn on Q2 and drag that inverting input down, shutting down the switched VCC again. Puzzle number two is the circuit driving that optocoupler. Given the presence and orientation of these diodes, and I've checked both circuit boards to verify the orientation of these diodes, what exactly would trigger the optocoupler? All of them misidentified them. Moving on once more, we've got what appears to be the main power supply circuit, based around an L6599 ATD, which is billed as an improved high voltage resonant controller. This uses a pair of MOSFETs to drive an inductor, which in turn drives the main transformer, which generates the isolated output, which is rectified and smoothed and filtered and... not quite there. There's one more circuit over on this side, which feeds back to the U1 optocoupler controlling the L6599 ATD. All I could make out on the top of the chip was what looked like 1002 PCCV, which I think means it's an NCS 1002 constant voltage and constant current secondary side controller. And the pinout seems to roughly tie in with that. 
Assuming that's what it is, it looks like op amp 1 is monitoring the voltage output, op amp 2 is monitoring the current output. Now I could be talking nonsense here, but I think this is what it's doing. The higher the output voltage, the lower output 1, because it's inverting it. So the less flows through Q7, and the higher the voltage to the optocoupler's cathode. The higher the output current, the lower output 2, because it's also inverting it. This pulls down on the emitter of Q7 and makes it more likely that output 1 is high enough to turn it on. So the higher the output current, the lower the optocoupler cathode voltage. The datasheet just uses a diode from each output so either of them can feed the optocoupler, but presumably the method here allows for a bit more interaction between the two, perhaps more of a constant power control than a constant current or voltage, although the datasheet for the whole driver module does refer to it as a constant current driver, as does its own lid. So that's the schematic and a breakdown of how I think it works. Now, it's a 200 watt fitting, but what if I don't want to use the whole thing at once? Well, I can fit a switch easily enough so that one of the drivers can be knocked off. That'll take it down to 100 watts. What if that's not enough, though? What if I want to take it lower than that? Well, there's a clue in that the driver kicks out 1.4 amps over quite a wide voltage range from 35.5 to 71.5 volts. What if I rearrange the connections on two of the pairs so that instead of driving two series connected strips in parallel, it drives two parallel connected strips in series. If I short circuit one pair of strips, it should drop its voltage to maintain the same current across the remaining pair. It depends on whether it can be teased down to any lower than 35.5 volts, as the remaining strips are likely to demand 33. Let's have a go. To do this, I need to add another connector at the top to disconnect from here so that I can connect these two pairs end to end. For the strips themselves, I need to change the connections at the far end. At the moment, they're connected with the positive of one to the negative of the other. I need to connect the positives together and the negatives together. At the top end, I'll leave them with the negative connection on one and the positive on the other. This means that as we get further away from the negative terminal, we get closer to the positive terminal by the same amount, so there's no voltage drop along the strip, as the overall length of copper track stays the same. Right, that's the bottom connections done. And whereas the outer ones are connected in parallel still, the middle ones are now connected in series. Let's make sure it still works as expected. And it does. Now I'll shut it down and I'll put in a link to short out one of the pairs. Let's see if the driver's happy to drive the other pair of strips on its own. Yes, it can. With an output voltage of 33.3 volts. The power meter is reading 152 watts, so all good so far. I'll give it a few minutes to warm up and just make sure it stays running. That's had 10 minutes. Voltage is still the same. Power consumption is still the same. I call that a win. I've added this metal clad double switch to the side. As you can see, one switch lets me remove 50 watts and the other switch lets me remove 100 watts. That's revealed something interesting with this Elster AS230 electricity meter. Besides the slight difference in the kilowatt hour readings, this one will read if, I'm, if I've got all four panels on. If I turn any off, that's turned half of them off, it's dropped to zero. This is still showing the proper reading. This one's not. And it's gone back into its loop now. It does that. So this it reads if there's 150 watts, but it doesn't read if there's 100 watts or less. Whether that's something that can be programmed in this meter, or it's just a feature of the meter, I don't know. Might have to get another one of these ones. Now, how about this dead section? Obviously it's not shorting out, as it would have taken down the whole strip. It's just one dead LED. In fact, I've already tested the LEDs and found it. It's marked here with a red dot. Unfortunately, LEDs are an absolute pig to try and remove from aluminium back circuit boards, and I don't have any matching ones, so that dead section is going to stay that way. But at least this is one of the ones which I can switch off. I'm not sure what I'll do with it yet. It's a bit ugly to have as an over-desk video light in what is actually the dining room. But I could set it up as a desk light out in the workshop. We'll see. Anyway, thanks for watching.